Permit me two quick interjections, would you? I have a medical condition and go into withdrawal if I go too long between my interjections. That last video got long. The ring roller video got way long. For the record, I start to feel bad when I get to asking for more than 15 minutes of your time. And at 30 minutes? Apparently, I felt twice as bad. But reception seems good so far. I'm glad everyone's enjoying it. There is some stuff I cut out of the ring roller video. Granted, it was completely extraneous and debatable if I should even be mentioning it here. But truth be told, I wouldn't have even thought to make this video if it weren't for some tooling I needed in that one. Notice the lack of connection between those two statements. Anyway, first a quick clarification. The ring roller was built for two-speed operation. I'm not quite sure if I said that out loud. That's the whole point of the third gear in this second drive shaft. This thing was born with the intention of being powered via that gear reduction. I mean, I spent enough time out here alone as it is. The last thing I needed was another thing to hand crank. <clears throat> Though it's still too fast for my drill. If I'm careful with the trigger, slow speed and the two to one torque gain I get works great. But one slip of the trigger and I can send metal shooting across my garage pretty fast. On paper, the numbers look good, but in practice, this wants to be maybe four to one. Twice as slow, basically, that'd, that'd be good. But bigger gears would have made this, well, bigger, as would have more gears. So maybe one day I'll throw a small gearbox on this. For now, I'll be careful with the drill. Or for bigger stuff, you may actually see me hand crank this in future videos. As much as I might complain, hand crankings never let me down. <coughs> Second, and fair warning, this is a bit out there. So if you're just here for the fire, feel free to skip ahead. But the ring roller reminded me of an old joke I've never been able to figure out. You remember, not long ago I mentioned how when I was a kid we'd basically be forced to check books out of the in-school library, and we got to talking about those science experiment books for kids and their relationship to child mortality rates? Well, those weren't the only books I'd check out. You see, nuns ran my school, iron fist kind of stuff. We'd have to mix it up a bit, the books I mean. Get us well-rounded, I suppose. Now, not like there were a lot of options, mind you. From what I recall, my standard fare, apart from the science books, were like space books. You remember those comically oversized but only 10-paged, full-color illustrated books of outer space? Stuff like this. That ring a bell? Those, and then there were the horror books. But like the bad ones no other library wanted. Time life, super spoopy story books? Yeah? Yeah? No? Now, to be honest, I don't exactly remember how the stories went, but I think they were always pretty much the same. Always that guy who narrowly escaped death by missing his ill-fated flight by less than a second. All because he stopped to answer a wrong number call from someone who sounded like his dead puppy from when he was a kid. Then, two days later, on the anniversary of the death of his puppy, of course, like a plane engine falls out of the sky and kills him while he's over at a friend's place, under their car, trying to get a rusted exhaust hanger off when he didn't even want to be there in the first place. And of course, his friend turns out to be the ghost of some World War II airplane mechanic who just wasn't good at engines. That, or he got sucked into the engine, was never seen again, but you can still hear him dropping wrenches to this day. Those books. And of course, there were the joke books. Let's not forget the joke books. And this, my friends, is where our story begins. Mind you, they were old. But you gotta remember, I was, I don't know, seven, and the book said joke on the cover. And that counted as checking out a book, right? Win-win. Now, of course, I've forgotten all of those jokes, except for one. One rotten, stinking joke I couldn't figure out then, and frankly, still can't figure out now. It haunts me, I tell you. Maybe it was a had-to-be-there joke. Like, back in the 20s, everyone would have gotten it. Hey, you know what? Anyone who could explain this to me, satisfactorily, wins a lifetime subscription to this channel. How about that? So imagine this. You turn the page and are rewarded with a full-sized, hand-drawn, line art depiction of three grown men sitting in a bathtub. You know, one of those old cast-iron tubs with the legs. And the three guys have big smiles on their faces, and they're all holding some kind of bathing or bathtub accessory. It takes up the whole page. Underneath the drawing, there's just a single question and the punchline. What do you call the first person in the bathtub? The ringleader. 
Hey, 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 now. This was a children's joke book, remember? Now, I apologize if you get that and it's just not a funny joke. I'm sorry. If, on the other hand, you had to stop the video because you can't stop laughing, please, please explain it to me. That joke has taken over my life, ruined what should have been some of my most cherished moments. I miss the birth of my children due to my mental absence as I continually try to process that joke. Okay, so ringleader, ring roller, hopefully you see the connection there. I don't want to dwell on it more than I have to. Let's bring this back in. What I thought we'd chat about is making our own braised tooling. Now, braised tooling in this video is a bit of a catch-all. It's not all braised, but I don't know what else to call it, to be honest. Composite tooling, maybe? I'll be making two tools with this round stock. One end will take the carbide, which I think you've seen here before, but we'll talk about it. And the other end will use high-speed steel, which you can't braise, not easily anyway. But first, a little bit of background. Let's head over to the shaper. In the last video, in order to cut the key seats in the knurled rollers, I had to make my own cutter because simply I just didn't have one of the right size. This is high-speed steel inserted onto a steel support. In this case, I couldn't use carbide. Carbide is just simply too brittle for the violent interrupted cuts you get on a shaper. It would have just broken like glass. So I had a couple of options. First, I could shape a piece of solid high-speed steel but what a pain that would be. I mean, that's a lot of grinding to do to get this shape out of this round. Second, I could have made it out of tool steel, just like we did with the Acme Tap. In that case, I could mill it to shape, which is a lot faster, but that would require hardening or heat treating. Instead, attaching just a small piece like this, I don't have to waste a ton of high-speed steel, since it's really just a small piece placed exactly where I need it on the tool. And it's easier to form, again, because it's small and I picked a piece of high-speed steel that's close to the shape that I was hoping to grind. Now, pulling something like this off in the home shop is really what I'd like to talk about, is sort of the impetus for this video. But let's take it a step at a time. We'll start with brazing carbide, I get that question a lot, and then we'll tackle the high-speed steel. Let's head back to the bench. What the? Oh, all over my freaking shoes. Brazing carbide, or brazing anything in general, isn't that hard to do if you use the right stuff and get the joints nice, clean, and well-fitted. Here are a couple examples I just had in reaching distance. One is a small lathe tool, and the other is a scraper. Both have carbide brazed onto their business ends. Both of these see a heck of a lot of force when they're in use. I mean, just look at that scraper braze. I mean, that's a very thin, albeit long, butt joint. There's not a lot of braised cross-section there, and I personally have never had one of these things come off. My apologies now at the risk of insulting your intelligence. Brazing is not welding. It's more like soldering than it is welding. Hotter than soldering, but not as hot as welding. In welding, materials are fused. They melt and run together, usually with the addition of some type of filler. The filler being the same as the base metal you're trying to weld, or metallurgically compatible. And in welding, once everything is melted, and run together. As it cools, it becomes one solid homogeneous thing, if you did it right. In brazing, however, the parts don't melt. Like the two parts you're trying to join don't melt. Only the brazing alloy or the filler does and flows through the joint, creating a strong mechanical bond. Just like soldering or sweating copper pipes. It's like really strong glue. Fun fact, if done correctly, brazing can be just as strong as welding. This silver braze in particular, the one we'll be using here, can hit, I don't know, 50, 60, maybe even 70,000 PSI. That's a heck of a lot of PSIs for a non-fusion weld. Before TIG welding, I think airplane frames were all brazed. Maybe they still are. I mean, what do I look like, an airplaneologist? Brazing is also a lot easier to automate than welding. You just clamp up your parts with a little bit of flux and some brazing alloy in there. Just run it through some machine, induction heater or some flames. It doesn't need like some million dollar robot with surgical precision to get in there with all 3D fancy dance moves with a TIG or a MIG gun. It's also lower temperature, so there's potentially less distortion. The, the list goes on. But let me get set up to weld our little tool here. I'll show you all the stuff we need, and we'll get this thing together. It's not going to braise itself with you guys just running your mouth. Pull that a little bit of stuff here. Don't want to confuse anyone, but just thought we could lay some groundwork, make some distinctions. On the left is everything I need for silver brazing. There's a torch flux, and brazing rod, or wire in this case. On the right, there's stuff you'd use for soldering. Again, flux, and in this case, silver solder, just to help confuse the matter. 
Now for soldering, you'd be using some kind of propane torch most likely. You wouldn't want to use the oxyacetylene torch shown on the left. That's filler for silver brazing, and that's filler for silver soldering. The difference, bluntly, is about 200 bucks. Honestly, I'm not sure how much this stuff costs, but I can tell you it was expensive when I bought it. Probably $100 for three feet of that brazing wire. I thought it was 50% silver, but there's a giant 45 on the front, so I'm gonna go with 45%. And the price can vary with whatever the value of silver happens to be. Compared to, I don't know, 15, 20 bucks for half a pound of this stuff, this has less than 5% silver in it, probably two or three. Okay, this just in. Out of curiosity, I checked the prices. This is Harris Safety Silve 4531. McMaster lists it for almost 80 bucks. Though I also got a result from Amazon for the same thing, 4531. It looked to be about the same size, 231 grams, it was 20 bucks. Now, I know McMaster can be a little expensive, but that seems excessive to me. Be sure to pay close attention to the product description before laying out your money. I do remember this stuff being expensive, but heck, if I can get it for 20 bucks, that's a game changer. Silver solder, in case you're wondering, is used for high strength or higher strength joints on copper pipe. It's usually called hard soldering, I think. You can't use silver solder to do silver brazing. Now don't quote me on this, but technically I think the difference between soldering and brazing is the temperature that the filler melts at. Maybe under 800 degrees is soldering. That seems hot, but let's say 800 for now. And hotter than that, you're getting into brazing. Again, mechanically, they're exactly the same thing. Like the bond physically works exactly the same. It's just that the fillers melt at different temperatures. The filler materials partner in crime is the flux. Again, this is for silver brazing and that's for soldering. Now this stuff is specifically for brazing to carbide, carbide and nickel alloys, I think and is generically called black flux. This is superior, well, you can read that part number there, as opposed to what's usually called white flux, which would be for steel, stainless steel, copper, that sort of thing. This isn't too bad. I think this costs somewhere south of 20 bucks. And in the home shop, it lasts a heck of a long time. Well, granted, I don't know what you're doing with it. Maybe you're slicking your hair back every morning. But if you're using it just for the occasional tool braze, it lasts a long time. Both of these fluxes do exactly the same thing, just at different temperatures. They prevent the base metals from oxidizing when you heat them up. You know, when you heat up metal with your torch and it gets all nasty, it helps to prevent that so that the filler will actually stick and not just beat up and roll off. They also help the filler to kind of wet out and fill the joint. If your filler is just pouring out during the weld and it just won't stick, you have the wrong flux, or you've gotten the flux too hot and it can't do its job. This stuff works to about 15 or 1600 degrees, probably even higher, and this stuff is good to four or five or 600 degrees. This would vaporize before your silver alloy even started to think about melting. I hope that doesn't confuse anyone mixing in this whole silver solder business, but I just wanted to clarify. Let me get rid of this stuff and we'll get set up for brazing. Number one rule in brazing, just like welding, and I guess soldering too, and gluing. Heck, number one rule in life is just get everything clean. You should feel comfortable eating off of it, unless you've fluxed it. Don't eat the flux. The tool shaft or the support is clean. I just machined and filed it. Some fine sandpaper wouldn't hurt. But for now, I wanna get this carbide clean. It works much better if you get bright, shiny surfaces up. And for carbide, of course, I'm using diamond. There's the before. There's the after. I'll do both sides. The joint could stand to be a little better, maybe a little bit of a snugger fit. Heck, probably a lot better, but this should work. Once happy, we can apply some flux. You can use a brush or whatever. I just happen to have this piece of filler wire handy. Good liberal coating never hurt. This stuff is a little bit dried up. You notice I'm wearing gloves. Glasses are also strongly recommended. I'm pretty sure I already said it, but it can't hurt. This is some nasty stuff. Don't get it in your eyes or in your pie hole. If you want to go crazy, you can clean off some of the excess. I found that the silver only really wants to wet where there's flux. So if you don't want this whole thing coated in silver, just don't flux the whole thing. Taking some care can just help to get a better looking braze joint if that sort of thing is important for what you're doing. This flux doesn't get used all that often. When I do use it, I don't need much. It has dried up a bit. But if I break through the delicious crust, I can get to the creamy filling, and that's still working well. If it gets much worse, it can be broken up and reconstituted with some water. 
But that's it, the joint's ready to weld. You could do this in your vise, of course. I just put a hole in this wooden block, it's easier to film. Not to mention the fact that my vise is currently hidden under 50 pounds of junk. Now for heat, I'm going to be using oxyacetylene. I think that's really what you want for silver brazing. For something small, though I've never tried it, you may be able to get away with like map gas, stuff that comes in the yellow bottles. You'd have to check the temperature rating, I'm not sure. But for small stuff, you may be able to get away without using oxyacetylene. Now, typically you want a much larger tip than this. Again, depends on the size of work you're doing. You don't want the same kind of flame you'd use for welding. You want a big, soft, easy-going flame. Remember, we just want to get the base parts hot. We don't want to melt them. Once they're red hot, I just add the silver, make sure it's flowing through the whole joint. You should have the whole part up the temperature and it'll sort of flow itself. You don't want to melt the filler, the solder or the silver with the flame. I mean, you could sort of preheat it a little bit, but you want the base material to melt it. So there it is, it's still pretty hot, so I'm not gonna to touch it. I don't know where all that blue came from, but it looks pretty all right. For the record, this is a stainless steel rod and of course a carbide insert. Next, I just need to clean this flux up. As is, it's not the prettiest looking thing in the world. Now with this black flux, hot water and a wire brush should clean it up pretty good. Though I will admit to having wire wheeled these things once or twice in my time to get the stubborn stuff off. Cleaned up pretty good. I got most of it off with hot water. I did wire brush it. With hot water and some vigorous scrubbing, the flux sort of washes away. When it's cold, it's like glass. On the wire wheel, it just sort of slowly chips away, breaks away. The silver seemed to flow well. I see it coming out every side there. It didn't fill the bottom. That's where the end mill left around. Had I milled this standing straight up with a flat bottom, I would have gotten a bond all the way around. But again, for demonstration purposes, there you have it. And as an added bonus, I managed to braze this tool without using up my entire roll of silver. Now, this isn't a real tool. Again, this was just for demonstration. I mean, it would certainly work. I guess you could put it on the lathe and use it as a, well, maybe an OD tool a facing tool and a chamfering tool. It would need a little bit of sharpening, of course. But in that case, it would have been smarter to put it on a, like a square shaft. And in fact, it kind of looks like a drill, doesn't it? In fact, hold on a minute, I'll be right back. Oh, Here's a masonry drill bit. Basically the same exact thing that we just made. Let's move on to the high-speed steel. Oh, and fun fact number two. I think we're up to two. If the area of that braze is, I don't know, a quarter inch, quarter inch square between the two sides, and that silver braze is good to 60,000 PSI to pick a number, the force keeping this carbide into this shank is almost 4,000 pounds, 2,000 kilograms. Now granted, if you bump this carbide into your tool post while you're trying to install this, it would shatter into 14 pieces, but that one last piece that was still brazed into the shank, 4,000 pounds. So here's the other half of the piece of stainless from before. It's the other half of this tool. I just took it over to the mill and cut a slot in the end. And here's a piece of high speed steel. I just cut off the parting tool we saw earlier. Just used a zip disc and cleaned it up on the belt grinder. You may have already guessed, this will fit here. Now, I know I said earlier, you can't braze high-speed steel. That's not entirely true. You can braze high-speed steel. It's just a lot trickier to do. You see, the carbide, in the case of this other tool, has much higher resistance to heat. High-speed steel, not so much. At least not when we're talking oxyacetylene. You can get it hot enough to get the silver brazing to flow without damaging the high-speed steel, but sheesh, with oxyacetylene, it'd be really easy to just let that get out of hand and you just ruin your piece of high-speed steel. Now, you can buy the good stuff, the higher quality high-speed steel that has a higher, like I guess, annealing temperature. Gives you a little bit more breathing room, but you still need to be careful. If you were doing this in an automated setup, like an induction heater, you can program for power and time. It's not a problem at all to braze high-speed steel. But with a torch, I don't know, you're really pushing your luck. Now, fortunately, there's another way to attach high-speed steel. And there you have it. Now, of course, with TIG welding, where it's welded, the high-speed steel is absolutely obliterated. But if you get in there quick, 
weld and get out without having to soak the whole piece. The high-speed steel up at the cutting edges is perfectly fine. Now, I made this to look like the shaper tool. I mean, this is how I made the shaper tool, just for continuity's sake. But in both these cases, you certainly could put on whatever shape, high-speed steel, or carbide you need for the work you need to do. Maybe this is round on round or round on square, or you put this in the center instead of offset to one side. This could maybe be turned into some kind of a light-duty form cutter. If you have some odd shape you need to route on the end of some part, or maybe a dovetail in aluminum or brass or something, or make a really small hand axe, you know, sky's the limit. It's curious, TIG welding high-speed steel to make a tool was sort of the premise for this video. It took all about three minutes. All right, well, there you have it. Maybe you already knew all of that. Maybe you picked up something you liked. We could talk about custom tooling till the cows come home, but I promised my kid his carbide-tipped Nerf dart by noon, so I gotta wrap this up. Thanks for watching.